Welcome to Chapter 10, Hypothesis Testing, the video series hosted by me, Tim Smith, on the workbook of Quantitative Tools and Techniques in Marketing, 2nd Edition. This is our last chapter. Let's think about what we've covered. In the first five chapters, we basically looked at data, we compared them to normal curves, we found ways of plotting that data using pie charts, bar charts, column charts, scatter charts, and line charts. We were also able to visually compare the data from one sample to another. Very useful. But at some point we had to pull out the big guns, the statistical test. So in chapter 6, 7, 8, and 9, we used a hypothesis test, and we did different statistical analysis on our data sets. We used a t-test here, where we were looking at two samples with numerical data. And what a t-test does is it basically asks the question, are the means of numerical data statistically significant? Are the differences in the means of numerical data statistically significant. So looking at one sample and the other sample, trying to see if those, where those averages sit, that, are they close enough together that we could say uh, it's within the, the expected range that we would see within this uh, randomness of the data? Or are they too far apart and they don't overlap enough in terms of their, uh, their distribution, so I can't say they're from the same population. That was a t-test using with two samples numerical data. We then went on to the f-test. We used that with three or more samples, again with numerical data. And what the f-test really asks is, can the variations between numerical data be considered within statistical expectations for random samples? It's really looking at the variance that's what a f-test does. It's looking at the variance of one sample and the variance of another sample and the variance between the samples. They're trying to say, well, does the variance look like it's what I should expect for all these samples? And that's an f-test. Again, being used with three or more samples and numerical data. We finally turn to categorical data with chi-square. And there we were trying to say, we have observed, but what's our weighted average uh, data that we would have had, or our expected data, and is our observed de categorical data and the expected categorical data statistically similar or different? So are these differences between observed and expected data statistically significant? That's what a chi-square does for our categorical data. We finally went to regression. We did both linear regression and multivariate regression, and you had some fun working on some exercises on that. And you saw clearly we were working with numerical data with that regression. You can do regression, by the way, with categorical data through using dummy variables. But anyway, with our regression, what we were trying to ask there is, we have these regression coefficients, remember our slope and our intercept. We we're trying to say, well, are these regression coefficients statistically different from zero? If they are not statistically different from zero, we basically don't have a line. If they are, then we can say that the regression equation somewhat matches the data. So these are a lot of different statistical tests. As marketers, we use them all. Notice that each statistical test addresses a particular kind of data, t-test, two-sample numerical, f-test, three-sample numerical, chi-square for categorical, and regression for pure numerical, where you're looking at one numerical variable versus another numerical variable. In each case, we reduced our statistical test down to an examination of that p-value. And we compared that p-value with respect to the chosen significance level, our alpha. And then we either accepted or rejected our null hypothesis, that hypothesis that all samples were from the same population. We used an alpha of 
However, researchers sometimes use an alpha of 1%, sometimes they use an alpha of 10%. In some fields, they use an alpha of 0.0001%, or even tighter than that. So how do you choose the right alpha? Well, it has to do with errors. There's type 1 and there's type 2. Let's look at a type 1. Type 1 is defined as rejecting the null hypothesis when it's true. With an alpha of 5%, we know that random variations between samples will yield to the rejection of the null hypothesis 5% of the time. When we reject this null hypothesis, but we should have actually accepted it, we have made a type 1 error. Makes sense. 5% is our alpha significance level. We get a p-value less than 5%. We declare it's separate samples. But what if they're not really separate samples? What if it's just the uh, odd randomness? Well, to reduce our chances of making a type 1 error, we could choose a smaller alpha. We'll see that that creates another challenge. If we wanted to make more errors, we can choose a larger alpha. And, you know, sometimes we choose an alpha of 10%. So that's more likely to cause a type 1 error. Alphas of 50%, you know you're going to be making a type 1 error about half the time at least. Maybe more, maybe less. See, there's this other challenge. Reducing it creates another challenge. That's a type 2 error. See, the type 2 error is when you reject the null hypothesis when it's false. For instance, with an alpha of 5%, we would accept the null hypothesis when the p-value is 30%. However, a p-value of 0.3 is not the same as stating the two samples are from the same population. It is possible that they really are from two different populations. We just didn't have enough data to show it. Now, when we accept the null hypothesis, when we should have rejected it, when we state the two samples are from the same population, when in fact they're not, we have made a type 2 error. How to reduce the chance of making a type 2 error? By choosing a larger alpha. Aha! Uh -huh. Now you have the problem. That creates a challenge with type 1 errors. A larger alpha increases the chance of making a type 1 error. Smaller alpha, smaller chance of type 1 error, but greater chance of a type 2 error. Larger alpha, well, greater chance of a type 1 error, but smaller chance of a type 2 error. So it's always a trade-off of what our significance level is going to be. We tend to use 5%. As I said, some market researchers use 1%. Others use 10%. You'll have to work through the nature of the problem. And from that nature of the problem, it'll guide the decision of what alpha you need to use. But note that you're always trading off this chance of a type 1 versus a type 2 error. Which alpha do you want? You'll always make some kind of an error. Well, if you're going to have this problem, how do you reduce the chance of making errors? Sample size. And we touched upon this earlier as well. To reduce the error, we can increase the size of the sample. But we saw that errors are reduced by 1 over the square root of the sample size. See, 1 over the square root of the sample size. So to reduce my chance of an error by a factor of 10, I have to increase my sample size by a factor of 100. That's kind of hard to do. You know, the, the sample size, the larger the sample, the more the cost. So as researchers, we're constantly making a trade-off between sample size and the willingness and the willingness to accept mostly correct, though not 100% correct, results. We accept these trade-offs, and we move on. We know that we'll be right roughly 95% of the time with an alpha of 5%. We choose a sample size that's large enough to give statistically meaningful results. As we need to get more tight, we'll increase the sample size, but at some point, it's a law of diminishing returns. It just starts to cost too much to keep growing that sample size. 
I wish you well, and I thank you for taking this course on quantitative tools and techniques in marketing. It's been a real pleasure. Bye now.